Good afternoon. Mr. Rickerman, Mr. McDowell, Mr. Duvall. Present. Mr. Vine. Mr. Davis. Here. Mayor Benjamin. Here. Mr. McDowell is coming in. <laughs> Yeah. Mr. McDowell, would you lead us in the invocation as you walk to the altar? Uh, I'm sorry, the podium. The dais. <laughs> no, sir. Waiting on you. First of all, let me pray for a good. <sighs> Thank you all for being here today. Let us pray. Oh Lord, for all that you've done for us for this day and for all of the hopeful and gracious possibilities you've allowed us to share in, we come to you today as we discuss this, our city, one Columbia. We simply ask that you might touch and invigorate us with your presence allow our conversations to be one of sensitivity and concern. Allow your spirit to discern the things that are necessary as our city continues to grow. We ask it in your name. Amen. 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 I thank you all for your patience. I, uh, I attended my daughter's middle school award day ceremony, so I had to be there. Try not to miss those moments if I, if I don't have to. So. Um, apologize for my tardiness. Madam City Manager? Yes, sir. Mayor Benjamin, Council, we will begin the City Council discussion a little bit uh, reordered. I would ask that Fire Chief Aubrey Jenkins come forward to present the Columbia Richland Fire Rescue Strategic Plan. Chief. Mayor, uh, Council members, City Manager. Um, thank you for this opportunity to come before you. I would tell you this is something that has taken a while for us to get to. Every time we try to kind of work on this strategic plan, things came up. Of course, 2015 with the flood and everything that happened afterwards. I promise you I'm going to be before you in less than five minutes. Um, <laughs> so I know you got other order of business to attend to today. Um, but basically, just uh, like I say, this, this is a very important plan to the department. Um, you, you always, if you fail the plan, you plan to fail. And certainly a strategic plan is your roadmap to kind of see where you're going to be within the next five years. So we have, we have a five year plan now. Um, and the, per, the people that help facilitate this plan is the Center for Public Safety Excellence, SIPSI for short. And this, um, Group has worked with uh, folks like the International Association of Fire Chiefs, uh, the International City County Management Association, the International Association of Firefighters, and the National Fire Protection Association. So, um, and we're, we're glad that they, you know, that, that we had the opportunity to work with them. And just a little brief history of the department. You know, the department been in, has been, uh, ever since 1903, it's been a paid uh, fire department. So we're talking about 115 years of rich history. Mm -hmm. um, and I would tell you the thing that happened along the way, uh, the first African-American um, firefighters actually was employed by the city fire department 50 years after it started. And so again, we're growing strong today for 115 years. This is 115th year. Um, how do we get, get to, to this plan? <clears throat> this is a community-driven strategic plan with external stakeholders. We sent out correspondence to stakeholders and you know we didn't know what we were gonna get. We sent out a number of correspondents. Uh, unfortunately and fortunately, you know, we only got eight people from the community, which county and the city to participate in, but it was a good discussion and we purposely didn't involve any fire personnel in their discussion. What we want to know what, what their expectation was from their fire department. And they gave us those expectations and also gave us their concerns. So there were expectations and there were concerns, but there was also 
uh, things that they liked about the department. So we were very open and transparent about what we did, and they gave us some good. I tell you one thing in the document that you may see, because um, I got question on that. When they the community expectation will say, well, they think that EMS and fire need to combine. Well, let me tell you, we have no plans to start our own EMS. Um, um, you know, at this time, we had no plans for that. That was just one of the community expectations. And that was, like I said, the whole plan was driven off the community expectations um, that we solicited from them. Then we did our internal stakeholders, which consist of all ranks in the fire department. And we had some very good discussion those uh, three days um, to put this plan together based on what the information that we got from the community. So we looked at ourselves through the SWAT, which is the strengths, the weakness, opportunities, and threats. And we just came up with all those, uh, you know, just everything that went into this plan we came up with. And we talked about it. And what we did, after we identified those things, and then we uh, put the document together with SIPSI. Uh, we looked at uh, nine goals. And out of all those nine goals, we got, we got objectives in all those goals. Uh, and we got a time frame on it. We purposely did not assign these <clears throat> these goals to anybody at this time. We're going to be having a executive meeting to assign these goals so we can start moving toward our, our um, accomplishments. So also in the back, we have a glossary of terms, acronyms, and, and initiatives. So basically, this is, our, this is our plan. I just wanted to kind of introduce it to you all, um, kind of tell you how we got there, the resource that we use. I'm quite sure you got a copy of the document. If you have any questions, I'll be glad to answer those questions. But I think, personally, I think this is a good plan. It, it really defines who, you know, who we are and where we want to be. But most, most importantly, it was, a, it was input from the community on their expectations of our department. And I just believe that the men and women of our department uh, are up for meeting those challenges. And lastly, what we're going to do is actually, we're going to be posting in our, all of our stations our mission, goals, and values. Uh, it's going to be on a cart far bigger than this to go on the wall. So it'll constantly remind all our employees of what we're all about. So I just want to kind of just introduce that to you all. Uh, hopefully you've read through it. If you haven't, please read through it. If you have any questions, certainly I'd be glad to answer them. Well, we did get an advanced copy. Look forward to uh, reviewing it in depth and following up with you on it, Chief. Thank you all. Um, yes, sir. Yeah, like I say, if any questions, um, I'll be glad to answer those questions, even once you review it. Awesome. All right. Thank you. Thank you, bro. Thank you, Chief. Thank you, Chief. All right. All right. Our next item for discussion is the Hampton Street and Calhoun Street Road Diet Concept Reports. Mr. David Beatty, Professional Engineer and Program Management Director for HDR. Good afternoon, Council. My name is David Beatty. I am representing the Richland Penny Program and want to come to you today and present two potential road diets on Hampton and Calhoun Streets. And the one question that we're asking for you today is will you allow us to move forward and present the concept to the public? So with that, I'll get right into the presentation. So we're talking about Calhoun and Hampton Streets. In the Richland County referendum that passed in 2012, there were 87 identified bicycle routes. Now we have reviewed all the different ways to accommodate bicyclists on these 87 routes, and we identified about seven routes that could be um, modified in a road diet, which a road diet is often reducing the number of lanes and or reducing the width of the lanes. So oftentimes in transportation, we reduce four lanes down to three lanes. And so that is a road diet. So that's what we're talking about today. We identified seven initially. We've narrowed that down. But today, we're only talking about Calhoun and Hampton. We want to approach two at first, see how that process goes, and see how it's received before we move on to developing any other potential road diets. We've been meeting with city staff for well over a year now on this subject, and I want to appreciate and publicly compliment your staff and the great communication that we've had between county staff, the Richland PDT, and city staff and get into this point. So it's been a great working <coughs> relationship to date. 
but we've identified that Calhoun and Hampton have the potential to be um, dieted, if you will. And on this next slide, what we've got most often on a lot of Hampton and Calhoun, we have four travel lanes, two in each direction, and these lanes are nine feet wide. So oftentimes when you're traveling on Hampton or Calhoun, because the lanes are only nine feet, you shy away from the parked cars on your right, or you may shy away from the car that's traveling in the same direction with you, or if you're in one of the middle lanes, you don't want to hit mirrors with someone that's approaching you. So effectively, you encroach into the adjacent lane so that you really don't have two lanes effectively going in each direction. Then also on Hampton, a lot of times, if there's a car that's stopped and turning left, they block the lane behind them. So effectively, the road operates as one lane in each direction and a middle turn lane, although it has four lanes. So what we're proposing on both Calhoun and Hampton is to remove one lane and restripe three lanes at 11 feet. We could accommodate a dedicated bicycle lane on each side. However, to get those widths, we're recommending that you remove parking on one side of the street, and preliminarily we've identified the north side as the side that would have parking removed. So I've explained how we would go from 9 to 11. It increases traffic capacity by doing this road diet. It accommodates bicyclists, but the negative is we're recommending the removal of on-street parking on one side. Would that be the north or the south, David? It would be on the north side on both Calhoun and Hampton. And the termini that we're talking about is on Calhoun beginning at Wayne near the Vista Greenway and going all the way to Hardin. Now the first two or three blocks on Calhoun, we would only use sharrows, which is basically pavement marking directing the traffic and the bicyclists to share the lane. And so on Calhoun from Wayne all the way to Hardin, we would recommend removing 30 total parking spaces on the north side. Now on Hampton, it's a little bit of a different matter. We would begin the study at Maine and go all the way to Hardin, but because there's more spaces, we would be recommending removal of about 90 spaces, which again, they're all on the north side. Now, what we've done is we have presented this concept, and to date, this is only a concept. We have gone out and we've measured the roadway width, we know the widths, we know the lanes, we know the number of parking spaces, so that's the amount of study that's been done to date. We've not started any design, and what we're proposing to you is we would like to go to the public, and we've already coordinated with the Greek Orthodox Church, they would allow us to present this idea June 28th and get the public's input. So we have already presented this concept to Richland County Council, and they have agreed with us partnering with your staff to conduct a public meeting and present the concept to the public. So at this point, we're not asking for your approval of the concept. We're asking for your approval to allow us to present it to the public, get their input, and then we'll come back to you with a summary of the public meeting and recommendations for the path forward. May I? Please, Mr. Uh, McDowell and Mr. Davis. And I know all of this has to be conceptualized and visualized. I guess the question that I, we're removing X number of parking spaces. How does that impact either the turning in from your left or, from, or your right into the, into the uh, spirit center? Will it impact that in, in, in any way? It really would not have an impact on the traffic flow. Or That's from terrain. Wayne to Harden, right? From Wayne to Harden, okay. Okay. So the short answer is I don't think that it would impact your turning movements or impact safety of turning movements when we, when we do these road diets. Okay, the road diet, of course, is Enlarging the, enlarging the width of the lanes. Yes, sir. And that's a diet. 
the diet is we're going from four <laughs> lanes to three. So that's the diet, four lanes to three. But then we are expanding the three lanes from nine to 11. So as you're traveling, you won't have that shy distance requirement or condition that exists inside. today. Okay. Well, I'll be certainly interested in seeing that and uh, getting the public's input on that. Thank Mr. you, Davis sir. and Ms. Devine. Um, I was just wondering um, the, the, the reason for selecting these streets or arteries is what? Well, there's two primary reasons. It was included in the county 2012 referendum. It was identified as a bike route. And it's also, both these routes have been uh, identified in the Columbia walk bike plan. So it was identified in both plans for some type of bicycle accommodation. Um, are there plans to look at some other arteries? Yes, there are. Um, the, the primary two other arteries that the penny is looking at would be a portion of Washington Street, as well as, uh, I think that's a primary one. We've also considered College and Pendleton. Can you go back on your slide, which is the first slide that's got those listed on? So the primary one would really be Hampton and Calhoun we're talking about today. And then probably the number seven is identified as Pickens, Washington, Wayne, but it's primarily Washington. And then probably the other one would be um, the Pickens Street is a potential. And it would be a mix of road diet and sharrows. And we've done no studies yet of those. So Pickens, as well as um, the Cal Calhoun and Hampton. And um, uh, please. So at, at, at the end of this um, testing of the model, how soon would you be c coming back or re receiving input from uh, folks in other parts of the city that have the same challenges that you have on Hampton and Calhoun. But I would imagine, and this is just my thoughts, if we conducted the public meeting June 28th, we would give the public a couple of weeks after that to mail in comments so we could summarize them early July, depending on your schedule, get back to you in July or August with the results and the recommendation. If it were favorable to move forward, then we could implement the project we could begin this fall or into early 2019 until the actual construction would start. Mr. Davis wants to know when you're coming well, north of Downwood. I'm, I'm uh, looking uh, at uh, other parts, really other parts of the city. Yeah. Ah, okay. So, so it's easiest dealing with penny projects right here, right now. Yes, sir. So I'm so, only talking about Richland yeah. penny projects. My, but my guess is if, we, if we're if able to move forward uh, here, show the success, we'll be able to, I think, make the, make the case in other parts of the, of the, of the city. That well. would be my thoughts, and that's why we're recommending that we take a bite at, yeah. at these two projects today, see how the public meeting goes, and then implement those, and it could be a, a, an example for the rest of the city. That might be my point. Yeah. Well, I just, I'm just, um, it's, it would be interesting to me to know why the folks with the penny tax made that decision with their other parts. You know, the, the penny contributions came from all parts of the city. The, the best that I can answer that is the, the study committee prior to 2012 that was composed of 39 citizens put together the entire penny tax referendum. And at that, that time, they included the 87 different potential bike routes throughout the county, primarily in the city. So that list was identified and put on the 2012 referendum, and that's what we've been challenged to implement. Yeah, Dave, Dave is the messenger. Not, not <laughs> um, hey, you, yeah. She know what they do with messengers. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, Ms. Ms. Devine? Concern I had, or not concern, but um, when you go to the public, I know that uh, Hampton pickens to Harden, there are several law firms there, um, and 
I just know that just hearing that it's a public hearing, they may not actually notice and realize that it affects them, but we'll be getting the calls when parking gets removed. So can you make sure that specifically um, businesses within that area get a letter or someone follow up with a call to make sure that they're part of the meeting? Yes, ma'am. We've coordinated with your staff, and what we're proposing to do is send out letters to each of the properties along the corridor. We plan on doing a media release, and we also plan on putting up yard signs along the route, advertising the public meeting. So if the litmus test is successful, we have an opportunity then to look at the other six areas, or we look at this as multi-branches branching off into other areas? My opinion is it would be looking at, at all of the other opportunities where the county and the city have projects that overlap. So there's really only a couple of more county-funded projects that we could overlap, which is independent of anything else the city chooses to do on their own. So if college, if Calhoun and Hampton went well, and both bodies were interested in moving forward, then we could come back and look at a couple more county-funded projects. Will there be penny monies available, you think? I do think so, <laughs> yes, sir. All right, all right, all right. Thank you. Thank um, so we, we just need to give a high sign, and then we have a work session, just, just uh, a nod, a wink, uh, uh -huh. yeah, we, we feel good about it, all right. Thank you, David. Let's Thank move you. forward with Thank that you. public notification that you just made at the public meeting. Thank you. All right. All right. Thank you, David. The next city council discussion item is a presentation um, in conjunction with the Columbia Urban League uh, in regards to the science technology enrichment program, our summer program that we always participate in. And Mr. Randy Davis, our Parks and Recreation Director, will lead that discussion. Want to make sure, I'm sure Randy will do this anyway, that we acknowledge Mr. J.T. McLawhorn, who is uh, director of the Columbia Urban League and here with us today. Good afternoon, Mayor, Council, City Manager. Um, I've come before you this afternoon to um, get your support for a continuous partnership that we've had with the Urban League, formerly the SWELP program, now entitled STEP, which stands for Science Technology Enrichment Program. And this program, um, kicks, wants to kick off next week. He's going to come in his own way and share with you the, the valuable experience that we afford young people the opportunity to have in working in some of our departments throughout the city. Currently, we have approximately 144 young people signed up in various, throughout various departments in the city um, willing to take on the challenge of exposing our young people to a number of different career opportunities that they may be familiar with or they may not be familiar with some. So I'm going to ask um, JT McLawhorn, Executive Director of Urban League, to come before you and share with you the valuable experience that young people gain from the opportunity they have with the City of Columbia. Good afternoon, members of council. I'm uh, Mayor. Uh, City Manager and staff, uh, I just want to thank you all for your support over the past, I guess, three decades or more. And um, I was just reflecting on our community. We got a lot of violence in our community. And uh, I don't know how you all feel, but so many of us have become somewhat numb to the violence. And I remember uh, back in the 80s, uh, we started the summer jobs program, just tried to compete with violence, giving kids an opportunity not to get caught up in gangs and violence. And as if there was ever a need uh, for a vigorated program, it's now. We have too much violence everywhere in our community. And it's gonna impede our economic progress because uh, folks don't want to invest in communities where violence is out of control. Even though our law enforcement is doing an excellent job, they can't solve the problem by themselves. It's going to take a lot of moving parts, and we think this particular program is going to be real important, getting young people connected. All the research, um, evidence, best practice data talk and discuss the importance of work experience and the order development of young people, work ethics, 
give people responsibility, give them something to look to. Uh, the Harvard professor, distinguished professor, Dr. William uh, Julius Wilson, wrote a commentary when he was at the University of Chicago some uh, 30 plus years ago. He talked about when work disappears. And we got communities now where young people live in that no one's working. And he talks about the implications when work disappears, what's the implications gonna have on young people? So we gotta really bring young people back into the game of work experience. And importantly today, uh, the uh, John Center for Political Studies uh, did a report on uh, underserved communities relative to technology. Mm -hmm. um, and what they determined that most underserved, disadvantaged communities kind of gravitate to the uh, service sector of our economy. And that's one of the fastest sectors that's automated. Have you been to a McDonald's lately? And go in there and they got a kiosk machine. In fact, I had someone at church uh, the other day, I was having a conversation, where are you gonna work this summer? She said, Mr. McLaughlin, I put a job application at McDonald's, but I haven't heard anything. I said, wow. You know, it used to be a time everybody could fall back on McDonald's. I'm using McDonald's, but just fast food places in general. The service sector of our economy, those jobs are automated quickly. And so it's, it's imperative that we prepare young people and, 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 and underclass uh, communities for these jobs. The Lumina Foundation, a think tank that talked about by year 2025, uh, that 6% of our workforce must have post-secondary education credentials. Now we change our focus to technology. We got to get young people embraced. I want to really express my appreciation to Mr. Davis in particular, the city manager, because the city of Columbia has identified about 150 job slots for young people to work this summer, and all of them be exposed to technology. That's really important. University of South Carolina is doing the same thing, and other uh, job sites that we have, we've asked everyone to do the same thing. I, I was telling someone, I was watching TV yesterday, I, I think it was yesterday, one day, and uh, Curtis Wilson was over at the Bull Street uh, complex, and he was meeting with a company called uh, Capgemini. I think it's a software company that does um, products for the insurance company. And it was interesting because the person he was interviewing said, you know, we got a lot of technology jobs, and we're looking for good people. And we're looking for people from USC, Clemson, MU, and MUSC. I, I said to Councilman Davis today, I said, you know what? We're gonna have to go there. We got a lot of new people coming to Columbia. We gotta let them know we got Benedict College. We got Columbia College. I know he didn't mean it in harm. And that's what you know, but we got to let people know throughout this community that they are also qualified for technological job opportunities, you know. So uh, we are, had sent a request to the city manager office uh, requesting uh, about $100,000 for the program, uh, serving around 250 young people. And now we do get money from the uh, water utility bill, and we've been talking about a social media program, like a GoFund or something, uh, because we really appreciate the city's support, but we do think that uh, the city authorized this uh, check off on the water bill several years ago. And I think that if we promote it, in essence, uh, that uh, we could raise problem a majority of the funds through that effort, you know, because if everybody on your water system gave one dollar, in essence, that'll be enough to fund the program, you know. But I want to thank you all uh, for, for y'all's support and your commitment uh, to all people in Columbia. And thank you for what you're doing, Mr. Mayor and members of council and promoting economic development in our community. I'd be happy to respond to any questions. Well, thank you, JT. Um, this uh, transition towards um, STEM and STEAM is so important as we adjust for a, a, just a rapidly changing world. So we appreciate the leadership of the Urban League. Continue to. Tamika? Okay. Ms. Dean posted um, an application two week camp for Richland One students. I think 10 through 13, that's not this, that's something separate. No, that's separate. something else, yeah. Okay. Yeah, we have, um, we have three initiatives going on, and uh, that, that 10, 11, 12, and 13, you gotta be 14 years old to work because of child labor laws. Mm -hmm. So this is for young people there in uh, a STEM-oriented work experience type 
uh, oh, experience. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's just it's just a two week camp, 10, 11, 12, and thirteen. All right, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, Thank my, you. I got my state JT today. Sure. My state of Black America today. State of Black America. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, I did uh, bring some copies. Uh, we were featured in the state of Black America, oh. uh, the uh, Columbia Urban League, and we did win the uh, case competition. It's a national competition. We had young people to uh, compete last year at the National Urban League Conference. We beat out Chicago, Houston, uh, and uh, some other. I think it was Philadelphia. Uh, in essence, so our young people from Columbia, South Carolina, we won first prize. Awesome. And then the state of Black America is geared this year to technology, and uh, we were selected uh, to do one of the essays and talked about the imperative of um, technology for underserved communities and populations. Thank you. Fantastic. I'll leave some of these here. Thanks, JT. Mr. Mayor, we'll continue our discussion and ask Mr. Davis to come back up. We're going to have a very important update for Council on our 2018 summer camp program. I know Randy is going to make some really key introductions of some wonderful new staff and team members that we have and wanted to brief you all on the exciting things they have planned for this summer. Good afternoon afternoon again. In prep- The staff with me today have been working diligently in the planning, preparation, and training um, focus since January 2018 in preparation for our summer camp um, program. Um, The overview of our summer camp program is the philosophy of play in that we want to empower children and encourage emotional and physical development through fun and educational programs that build a positive um, sense of self. So that is the overview of the program. The eligibility eligibility is children ages five by June 1st, 2018 to age 12. We have two teen camps, one at the Booker Washington Heights um, Center and one at Emily Douglas are the two teen camps. The remaining centers, again, are the of camps age five to 12. The camps are structured in the various category, age categories for um, appropriate programming. And again, um, the staff I have with me today will share with you more details in terms of the training and the preparation and the planning that's been going on in our department since January 1st. And they're gonna, um, I'm gonna ask Uh, Mr. Kerry Rich to come up and give some uh, comments, as well as Christy Wright. Um, Kerry Rich is the Recreation Superintendent for the Recreation Division, and Christy Wright is the Assistant Superintendent within the Recreation Division. They're going to share with you and and as well as introduce additional staff um, that's been involved in the training. Good afternoon. Um, To ensure the safety um, of all of our children and to ensure that it's a first priority and enhance the overall experience for patrons in our park, we've completed a series of different trainings throughout the year. Um, First and foremost, we did the DSS child care training in which I'll go in further detail on the next slide. We also completed the first aid CPR AED training. Also in April of 2018, we completed an all staff training where we changed the culture and also focused on customer service. Um, we also in a, also had active shooter training in May of 2018. Um, our summer camp organizational training day we currently had in May 2018 where we focused on our out of school time training manual, which I'll go into further detail um, throughout the presentation. We also had our darkness to light training. 
bloodborne pathogens training and our summer feeding training. Um, here, June 6th through the 8th, we'll be concentrating on our new hires and our seasonal staff where they are going to receive organizational training along with first aid, CPR, AED training. Our DSS training, we partnered with the South Carolina Center for Child Care Development um, to provide our staff with 20 hours of child care training. Um, we focused on several different areas, child care and development, program administration, curriculum and activities, child guidance. We also focused on the professional development side of the house along with health and safety and special needs. Um, again, to reiterate what Mr. Davis has spoke about earlier, with this training, our recreation staff um, were now certified to be able to supervise children beginning at age five in our weekly summer camp program. Um, but under no circumstances will any child be accepted under the age of five. I'll now turn it over to Mr. Kerrywich to talk about some of the additional staff that we'll have. Excuse me. May I ask, let me ask you a follow-up question. Um, that last sentence was that the children's age starts at five. Yes, sir. Why five and not well, higher? I'm sorry? Why five and not higher? Okay, so for age five, we, decide, we decided as a as a department that those children that are already grade school children that already attend grade school kindergarten age kindergarten that they've already completed at least one year of grade school so that on top of the training that we already have those children that are age five have siblings that are older so that now that we are certified we would be able to have the opportunity to allow those parents to bring those students as well since we're certified under child care so are they are age five and have attended kindergarten with their age five prior to june 1st they're able to attend okay. as well but most of the children that that come to our parks throughout the summer have probably already attended a grade school pre-k pre or okay. five-year-old program prior to maybe this is perhaps in another slide what's the ratio students to teachers it was in that slide right before that one yes we're about to get to it no, we passed I can it. go back to that. So it? ages 5 to 12 will have a My ratio. My machine messed up and I couldn't see it. Okay. <laughs> yes. Ages 5 to 12 will have a 1 to 12 ratio. And then ages 13 to 17, which Mr. In Mr. Davis indicated, which would be our teen camps, which is Emily Douglas um, and the Catherine Belfield Center, they'll have a ratio of 1 to 15. All right. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Good afternoon, Mayor. Good afternoon, City Council, City Manager. Um, before I speak to uh, the, the additional staff, before I speak about the uh, district coordinators, I just wanted to first of all offer a heartfelt thanks to the City Manager um, for uh, extending us uh, extra staff. Uh, we've been challenged in that area. Special thanks to Ms. Benjamin and her HR staff for expediting the process so that we were able to, to get staff quickly on board and get ready uh, for the summer. Uh, before, before now, we had no room or no margin for error. Um, our margin for error was paper thin or even zero <laughs> when it came to staff. And then if one called out sick, it was a mad shift, a major shift. And um, now having the extra staff allows us to have a little bit of cushion and allows us to be able to operate um, as smoothly as possible. Um, the additional staff centers around uh, three key new positions. Um, the Parks and Recreation District Coordinators. Uh, the three parks, parks and Recreation District Coordinators that will supervise assigned recreation centers. These district coordinators duties are to provide oversight and supervise recreation division employees in charge of the recreation centers and neighborhood parks. Uh, this summer camp, the district coordinators will, be, uh, will monitor enrollment, the age of participants, staffing, program curriculum, and ensuring the day-to-day -day policies and procedures uh, being adhered to. Ultimately, it gives us the daily accountability that's needed uh, regarding the aforementioned. And more importantly, uh, this is their only job. This is their sole responsibility, so they won't have any shared responsibilities but to make sure um, our parks are operating the way they need to operate them from a compliance standpoint. And uh, if I could quickly just introduce our three <laughs> New district coordinators. First, um, we have Ms. Courtney Proctor Bates. You can stand. Uh, Ms. Bates comes from uh, New Jersey, 
and she brings a ton of experience uh, working in the city of New Jersey. She has family here, and uh, while moving to South Carolina to get closer to her family, we also had a job opening uh, simultaneously, so it ended up being a perfect fit uh, for Ms. Proctor Bates to be here with us with the city of Columbia. We're, uh, we're so proud to have her with us. Second, we have Mr. James McCord. Uh, he's a district coordinator. And Mr. McCord has been with the City of Columbia Parks and Recreation for about 20 years. Uh, he, brings a, uh, he brings a plethora of experience. Um, he has a law enforcement background that, that supports him. And that was one of the, um, one of the main things that attracted, to, uh, attracted him to us when it came to applying for the job because he's, uh, he's black and white, he's not going to budge, and we needed that type of supervision when it came to to our staff, so we're happy to have Mr. James McCord in the capacity of district coordinator. And lastly, we have uh, Ms. Tracy Chapman. Uh, Ms. Tracy Chapman also brings about 20 years of experience um, to the position. Uh, she's worked at various parks, various different levels, uh, so she's, uh, uh, she brings an insight and perspective that's needed uh, for this particular position, and we're also excited to have Ms. Tracy Chapman. Uh, we also have another staff member that's not here, uh, Ms. Um, Camilla Sampson, and she's our, uh, she's our safety coordinator. And this position plans, coordinates, implements, and oversees, and administers a comprehensive employee safety and compliance program in accordance with the requirements of the Parks and Recreation uh, Department. She br also brings a ton of experience to uh, the department. She's been really, really good and insightful with some of the trainings she's brought uh, to the department. Um, Carrie, Carrie what's, what's her past experience? Uh, she comes to us from Richland County Recreation. And she was there for us. She was their compliance director, did a terrific job for them. So she, we're happy to have her with us also. Uh, we're, we're eager to move forward. Uh, we're, we're eager to attack the summer. We understand uh, the elephant in the room. We understand what happened at Lord Park. Uh, we're, uh, we're not running from it. Um, we're prepared. And when you're prepared, it makes you a little bit more excited. It gives you the confidence. And because of the training, Ms. Crystal Wright has done a terrific job of spearheading our efforts. And the one thing that I've constantly said to, to our staff is that we can't operate in fear. If we operate in fear, then we rob our kids, we rob our communities of, of opportunities. We rob our youth of, of exposure. We rob our seniors of exposure. So uh, we understand, Ms. Wilson constantly reminds us that it's, uh, it, it, it's not a dress rehearsal. And I've always been excited about game time. And for me, it's game time. We're excited. We're going head on. And uh, we're prepared and we're excited. And I'll turn it over to Ms. Uh, Ms. Wanda Austin, who's our recreation it's not a recreation coordinator. Resource coordinator, excuse me. Ms. Ms. Wanda also brings a lot of experience. She wears, a, wears many, many hats for us. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. I'm going to talk about our summer staff that we have working in our parks. As Christy, Ms. Wright said before, our ratio for our 5 to 12 year olds is 1 to 12. And for our teens, it's 1 to 15. So within our parks, we have different maximum of capacity for the kids in the camp. For our community centers, we have up to 60. We do 70 at Greenview because there's a great demand at Greenview. And at our smaller parks, we do 25 uh, to 30. And our, our smaller parks is what we call our neighborhood parks, which would be Melrose, Sims, which are like one room buildings, so that we will be overcrowded in those buildings. And so for those parks, we do 25 to 30 students at the max. And um, we have summer staff staff that we hire. We do one coordinator for the large for the community centers and four park aides, summer park aides. And for Greenview, we do one summer staff aide leader and five camp aides because of the 70 ratio kids we have there. Um, we also have our part-time staff go full-time in the summer as to help out with our neighborhood kids that are walk-ins because we do not stop the neighborhood kids from coming in. So our permanent staff are there to do programming for the kids that are there in the neighborhood so they'll have some activity as well. Any questions? Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, how many parks do we have open and how many did we have open last year? 
We have a total of 14 parks total, building-wise capacity. This year, we're going to have 12, 12, 13 open because one of us being remodeled. Um, so we moved that park to one of our other parks, South Edison. So Heath, Hampton Park is being remodeled, so we moved it their building and their operation to South Edison Park. Right. And the same amount of numbers were open last year as well. Well, I'm, I'm, I recognize the elephant in the room also. Uh, do you three feel comfortable that we have enough staff on duty this year to properly supervise the students that come to our parks? We feel comfortable that we have the amount of staff coming in to occupy the elephant in the room as we speak. Um, because we'll have more adequate staffing throughout all of our parks um, and we will have a cap on how many kids we can have at each park and our district coordinators will be out to make sure that everything is going according to our SOP that we have in line now. So we have a lot more people out there in the field to make sure that everything is present and accounted for, that we have supplies that we need, we have proper staffing that we need, and that everything is in a quarter, and that makes sure that there's enough staff to handle the summer camp as well as our neighborhood children as well. Yes, sir. We feel very, very, very confident of that. Uh, the district coordinators, we've got three district coordinators. Are these park districts? Do, did we establish districts for the park separate from the districts for the council members? I'll let um, the superintendent talk about that. In one district, um, Ms. Courtney Park debates will uh, she will manage or supervise Higher Park, Woodland Park, Edisto Park, Hampton Park, and Sims Park. And let me just say this: we, when it came to assigning the district coordinators to the different districts, uh, we were very strategic in terms of how we wanted to do it. Um, uh, with Ms. Proctor debates, she's new, um, obviously, and we wanted to assign her to a district uh, that was that was heavy in experience. Uh, those, those parks in that particular district have seasoned uh, staff members, recreation leaders. Uh, they've done a terrific job of taking ownership of not only the, the parks and facilities, but they have great relationships within their communities. So we thought it helped in the transition with someone new coming to that uh, particular district. With Mr. James McCord, uh, who will supervise Pinehurst, Lorick, St. Anna's, and Emily Douglas, uh, even though he's worked at many different locations within uh, the city of Columbia Parks and Recreation. He comes from us, comes to us from uh, Pinehurst Park, and uh, because of the familiarity, because of the insight and connection that he shares with the with the community and the community partners, uh, we wanted to make sure we didn't separate that. We wanted to keep some consistency right there. And lastly, Ms. Tracy Chapman um, in her district, uh, Greenview, MLK, Melrose, Heathwood, Busby. Tracy has also been a constant in the Greenview community. Uh, especially with our senior exercise program. Uh, we certainly uh, wanted to make sure we kept her connected to that area, but also because of her familiarity and insight that she shared for the Greenview, uh, the Greenview area. That's just one of the parks, but we were, we were very strategic in terms of how we tried to assign uh, the district supervisors to different districts. There's, there's a lot of distance between those parks. Uh, they've moved my slides, Rob. It's, uh, I can't it's, tell you the ones I'm talking about. But it's, irrespective, it's, it's obviously irrespective of geography and, and more so around staff and, and, and systems and, and, and training. So uh, it, that's where we are. It, it, it doesn't have anything to do to answer your question, Mr. Duvall, about you all's council districts and proximity of um, locations within your council districts. It has much more to do with um, the need for certain skill sets in certain locations um, and also trying to balance the load, so to speak, of a MLK and a uh, Greenview with a very seasoned person who's been used to, to handling those um, major community centers um, and also some of the other challenges, maybe even community challenges that some of our other parts um, or recreation centers have with the skill set of the individuals who are used to and have had the experience of dealing with not just our employees in those communities but the citizens in those communities and the different um, needs that vary between those locations. 
In terms of the operating hours, uh, Monday through Thursday, 10 a.m. to 9 p.m., and Friday, 10 a.m. to 8 p.m., open to the public. However, uh, we understand that uh, we have to do everything decent and in order. And so for the public, there will be posted signs of times in which the gym will be available or the activity room will be available for their engagement and which would be separate from um, the instructor uh, program that we're doing for our summer camps. So we will have full-time and permanent and full-time, part-time permanent staff available to accommodate um, the general public as well as the proper staffing ratios to accommodate our, our summer camp um, program. So the public will have to get used to the structure that's in place in terms of, of uh, availability and use of space in, in the facilities, whether it's a gym or whether it's uh, an activity room. That's, that's, in, that's the only way we can uh, control the, um, the numbers, if you will. And Randy, you, it is very important. I mean, there's no elephants in the room, so let me just say that. We operate based off what is most safe. And with any institution, any organization, when there's a, a incident that's occurred, it's a, it presents an opportunity to reevaluate. And so what we've tried to do going into this summer, um, not only reinforce and take the opportunity to enhance, and it's truly an enhancement. We have very capable staff in City of Columbia Parks and Recreation, but to enhance their abilities with the trainings that have been outlined, but to also acknowledge that with just the world we live in, there are things um, that happens, predators among us, active shooter incidents, et cetera. So many of the programming changes, the, the, the changes that Randy and the staff are going over have even more to do with us being extremely safety conscious and meetings they've had with CPD and others to ensure that our facilities are being maintained, not just from a staffing perspective and training that we need to do internally, but also recognizing that there will be people or incidents that come from the outside, which is what has happened previously, that we have to take further precautionary steps to ensure that we are making sure our babies and our children who are coming to our city parks and their families are safe. And that's it. I mean, that's what it's about. That's what it's always going to be about from my standpoint. And I appreciate the fact that we've had um, additional training, but also just an adherence to protocol. The challenge that we've had many times in the past is that compassion plays a role here. And, and we recognize the larger role we have in, in helping raise the community's children. And you can't deviate from that. So, I mean, it's a- uh, Trying important. to balance Yeah, that yeah it, it, it really is. So, um, excited about the, the, the way forward. Thank you all for your dedication to it. Thank you, uh, Teresa. Mr. Mr. McDowell. Yes. The thing that, um, I guess the thing that I want to be comfortable with the levels of ratios. Uh, we looked at 1 to 12 and 1 to 15 and 1 to 25. Based on all that we know, based on all that we know, uh, safety, of course, becomes a tremendous issue in the life of any part. I think we've done a, an exceptional job bringing in new folk, restructuring, adding on some, some new parameters. But the bottom line still is safety. Exactly. And I think I want to be comfortable with 1 to 15. I want to be comfortable with 125. I don't know if that involves other folk who might play into those ratios because I think the fabric of this city and this council simply says we want our children safe. That's to be safe, to have a good time, and to walk away with some real lasting experiences. So I want to be safe. So if there is a need at some point in time for us to decrease the ratios or add in additional persons, I think we need that kind of latitude and we need that kind of, I think it's what Ms. Wilson is saying, the emphasis is safety. And if we allow something to happen and it happens because we did not have 
enough personnel, then we're going to find ourselves in a real quagmire. Randy, if I might, and I'm going to let him answer all the questions. He's, T is totally uh, capable, more capable than me, and is the expert at answering them. But I, but I do have, I feel compelled to say, to your point, Reverend McDowell, that the institution of, and the implementation of, of the district coordinators really should not be minimized. That is a difference right. from last summer. And my expectation, and I don't know if I, I've said it every kind of way, and I could keep saying it, but I don't think I need to, because I think those three individuals that have been chosen really get it, but that's their job to recognize that on any given day at those parts that are under their purview, that they need to be, you know, raising their hands and shouting and saying, I need more support here. If I don't, you know, if there's a staffing issue, we have added a significant amount of staff. I don't anticipate that will be an issue. And there is no one in 25, just to be clear, but that's a maximum number. That 25 is a maximum number of children. I'll let Randy and those talk about that or clarify it. The ratios are the one in 12 and the one in 15. But but I think we have more than enough now um, to, to, you know, really be well within those ratios. Good. I'm glad to hear that because it at least gives us an additional layer. It's an additional layer. Protection. And their eyes and ears are to be there every single day. All right, let, let me just say a word to our coordinators. Keep your eyes open. And if there is things that we need to do, you need to remind us, say to us, with vehement voices, we need your help. Is that a deal? At least give me a head nod or something. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Thank right. you. Uh, Councilman McDowell, I just want to um, let Christy Wright say a few words to, to your concerns, and I will assure you that the training that we've been through and the preparation that um, staff have been um, going through you know, for this summer is probably the most stringent in the state. Okay, uh, we, we're well below the um, the, um, the, the standard from a, from a state standpoint is typically 1 to 15. We're 1 to 12. So um, she can tell you a little bit more. Thank you. All right. Um, Ms. Wanda, pretty, Ms. Wanda pretty much did a really good job when she was describing um, our staff to child ratio. Um, for our community centers where we have 60 or at least 60 campers, the summer camp coordinator is one of our permanent staffing members that we currently already have that has already gone through the 20 hours of DSS training. So outside of just that one summer camp coordinator that's with the children, they'll also get that summer camp leader along with camp aides as well. Um, when, you, when Mr. Davis was speaking about the, the programming within the park uh, during summertime, our permanent and part-time staff that we have along with the additional hires that Mr. Rich went in, into grave detail about. They'll also be um, monitoring the grounds. They'll also be inside ensuring that we have structured activities along. So we have several different components as far as staffing and ratio is concerned to be able to address the needs of the, of, of the public for the summer. Thank you. You're welcome. And I just have two more slides and I'll be very quick. I know time is of essence. Um, thank you. Thank you. Real quickly, um, <clears throat> some of the summer activities throughout the summer that's going to be going on. We do have an entrepreneur camp in partnership with the um, gentleman out at, out at Greenview Park, um, Paul, Paul Smith. This is his second year since, um, since I've been working with the city that he's um, put on the entrepreneur camp, but I think he's done it in the um, previous years as well. Drills and skills, July 16th through the 20th, football, golf, and cheerleading will be going on in August 6th through the 10th, tennis, soccer, and basketball. Summer concert series began on this past Saturday with the Atlantic Star. So over 3,000 people were in attendance. It was probably the biggest crowd I've ever um, um, had the experience of, of watching one of our summer concerts, um, R&B, Atlantic Star. And prime time in the park will begin June 22nd um, in June at various locations. The first one is a pool party at um, Greenview Park, July 13th. Badges and Parks basketball at, at Lorick Park 
and August 3rd, end of summer, on Pooh Bash at Maxi Gray. Movies in the Park, the first one this was this past Friday. It was rained out, emoji the movie, but uh, hopefully Peter Rabbit will not be rained out, <laughs> okay? Um, our proposed free swim days take place at Greenview Park every Monday from 1 to 6, and Maxi Gray Park um, every Friday from 1 to 6. And during those early morning hours, the pools will be shut down for, for maintenance, routine maintenance. Randy, thank you. Thank you, Carrie, Christy, Wanda, all of our new uh, district coordinators. I'm very pleased at, you know, the level of importance the team has placed on this summer and, and, and their daily responsibilities still moving right along. Um, so if there are no more questions, Mayor, Mr. Thank you. All. Thank you. Thank you. Our welcome. next. And welcome. Our next discussion item is our employee retiree health care program. Ms. Pamela Benjamin, Human Resources Director and Chief of Staff, will take us through um, many of the items we've already started discussing. Yeah. My battery Fine. went. I'm sorry. My battery went dead. It's plugged in, so I don't know what's wrong. Mine too. So. Yeah, I think power is, seems to be an issue up there, but IT support is headed your way, Mr. Yeah. Vine. Um, let me say, as Ms. Benjamin prepares for her discussion points, that we know that this subject matter is complicated, okay? We're, we have not tried to breeze over it by any means. Um, we've actually been talking about it for a very long time on multiple occasions with you all. I do think it's very important as the public um, employees, retirees begin to now recognize that the discussion is occurring that they also understand that this discussion matter and the content of it affects individuals very differently. So you cannot um, make blanket statements and assume that one, your retirement, um, how it's impacted is the same or your insurance is the same as another. And so what we're gonna try to do today is go back through a lot of the discussion points, point out where there are um, you know, places where it'll be different for individuals, depending on lots of different things, particularly points in time where state uh, rules and regulations may have changed or the city may have changed um, how we are handling health care over the years. So Pam's going to do her best to do that. I know it'll be up to council to um, seek any public input thereafter, but we're just here to make sure we're giving you accurate information and to try to guide council with the recommendations that really must be made. Um, there won't be a vote on this today. I think that's been a question, Mr. Mayor, as far as the health care in and of itself. Obviously, these, de these decision points impact our budget, which there will be a vote on that tonight, the first of, of two readings, but the health care piece um, hopefully by June 19th is something that the, the details of it, we will have worked out. Sure. And for those of us having tech problems, I'm not, I am not. Um, is this the same presentation that we have here in the hard copy? It is. Okay. There are right. a few. We change it? Okay. And just, <laughs> corrections. Just in case you might, you might want to. Okay. okay. I've noticed a few misspell okay. words, those type of things. So I've made some edits. Nothing substantive. So. Nothing substantive. Nothing substantive. Okay. And what I want to point out as well is that this is um, kind of a re-engineering of the um, the presentation that was given the last time in May, a week ago. Um, but what I've noticed is, and, and like Ms. Wilson said, healthcare is very confusing. It's very confusing to all employees. And so I've added some additional slides to really try and help people understand the terminology we're using and the and understand what the current benefits look like and then understand what the questions that are being asked and, and how we move forward. So I've tried to add a few slides. It may seem a little redundant. It may seem like um, people know this information, but trust me, from the, the um, responses I've received over the last couple of weeks, people are very confused and um, current employees don't know what benefits they have and Everybody's talking to their neighbor and talking to their coworker who's giving them incorrect information. So this is an attempt to kind of try and give some, some good information that's accurate 
um, to help people understand what we're really dealing with. So, so I'll just say that and I'll get started. So, you know, a lot of things that we go over um, is, is, is like talking about alphabet soup. It's all these acronyms and all these, these words. And so I wanted to make sure people understand the, the terms that we're talking about. Um, you all know that we discussed OPEB last time, which is other post-employment benefits. Um, and these are mostly um, benefits for state and local governments. And we're really talking about healthcare benefits. So OPEB encompasses those healthcare benefits that a state and a local government are providing to its employees and its retirees. So that's what that term is referring to. DDB, we said that a lot. And people said DDP or DD, you know, it got a lot of different, different um, words, but it means the defined dollar benefit. And that defined dollar benefit is the amount the city contributes for retirees and their spouse health insurance coverage. Um, the DDB has a cap and it is $1,130 for the retiree per month and $840 per month for the, their dependents or spouses. Um, the DDB for the post-65 retirees or those Medicare eligible um, is $300 for the retiree and $225 for their dependent, respectfully. HRA was a term we, we introduced to you guys last week and for council, we've been talking to you several months about the possibility of having an HRA for the, the um, DDB distribution. So an HRA is a health reimbursement account. It's an IRS approved employer funded health benefit that reimburses employees for out of pocket medical expenses and individual health insurance premiums. Ma'am. Yes, sir. Is the contribution into an HRA by the city taxable to the employee that gets it? It depends. <laughs> it depends, Mr. Uh, Mr. Duval, on how that's structured okay. and how it's distributed. So that's one of the things that we'll have to work through with an HRA administrator to make sure that we minimize any kind of tax liability or any tax issues that it may cause the retirees. But it could potentially be, it potentially it could be taxable. But we're gonna try and make sure that we minimize any impact that that has and, and try for it not to be. But there are some IRS regulations that, that may okay. cause for it to have some tax implications. Um, Medicare is the federal health insurance program for people who are 65 or older. Um, anybody who knows anything about Medicare knows there's a Part A and a Part B. The Part A is the hospital portion that covers inpatient hospital stays, um, care and skilled nursing homes, uh, hospice care, and some other home health care. The Part B is um, for doctor's services outpatient care, medical supplies, and preventable services. Um, there, there are some other alphabets to Medicare. There's the D, there's the E, there's other, there's other things. But I just wanted to keep it simple with the A and B because those are the biggest portions of the Medicare program. So any questions about that? That's just some, some general um, definitions. I could have done ACA and I could have done, you know, 20 more, but I thought I'd keep it simple with those. So let's talk about what the city offers right now. And I will say that the city offers wonderful benefits and people um, need to be very grateful that we, we are doing that and we're trying to preserve as much of that as possible with the decisions that are being made. So currently the city has three different plans. We have a core, a base, a buy-up plan that's offered to active and retired employees, their spouses and or their dependents. And depending on what plan they're in, the premiums vary based on the plan. The coinsurances, the deductibles, and those type of things vary according to the plan as well. But those are our three plans that we offer. The city is self-insured. Everybody always says that we have Blue Cross Blue Shield insurance. We do not. We are self-insured, which means we, we assume all the burden of that responsibility. All the claims, all the administrative fees, all the costs associated with providing that health benefit the city assumes that cost. So when people say we have Blue Cross Blue Shield insurance, we do not. We are self-insured. And I like for people to understand that because I hear that a lot. Now, Blue Cross Blue Shield is our third-party administrator. 
So they are responsible for administering the program, making sure the claims get processed, um, making sure that our health and wellness programs get administered, and they also assist us with managing the employee health center. And that's run by a partnership with Doctors Care. And provide the network. Yes, sir. And key to that, thank you for mentioning that, Mr. Duvall, is that we have the ability to use their network. And their network is, um, they negotiate with the providers in order to provide us with very good cost associated with people receiving medical services. So that is very important. Um, all active employees have the opportunity to cover themselves, their spouses, and their dependents on one of our three programs. We have about 2,023 employees that are covered on our health plan. So again, like I said last week, some employees are covered under TRICARE, or they're covered under their spouse's insurance, and they're not on our plan. But he's going to mute himself. <laughs> Can we do that here? <laughs> um, as far as the city department budgets are concerned, each department's budget is charged a fee for insurance coverage for all employees, and this amount includes um, the amount that goes towards the total cost of health care, includes the premiums as well as what the departments are funding. So um, each employee's department is contributing to the funding of their insurance. So that's coming from the city as well. And that is, has budget implications. And Missy will certainly talk about um, the budget and the, the personnel services dollars that are associated with that. Does anybody have any questions so far? Everybody's keeping up with me? Reverend McDowell, did you have a question? No, I'm fine. So as far as um, currently who is eligible for employee retiree health insurance at this time, right now employees are eligible for retiree health insurance if they meet the following criteria. If they're employed prior to July 1st of 2009, they must have 20 years of service with the city, be employed with the city at the time of retirement, and be eligible with years of service to retire based on PIBA or the retirement system's requirements. There was a lot, there's been a lot of questions about who's eligible and who's not and those type things. So I wanted to have this slide to be clarifying. If they were employed after July 1st, 2009, they gotta have 25 or 28 years of service, be employed with the city at the time of retirement, be eligible with the years of service to retire based on PIBA requirements. Um, beginning in 2017, and, and you all, um, implemented this in 2016, when an employee retires, they can maintain their current level of coverage. Um, they can't add any dependents after they leave, and they can't increase their tier of coverage. Um, they can drop dependents, and they can um, participate in a lower tier. So for example, if they leave here with employee spouse coverage and go to retiree coverage, they can maintain that employee spouse coverage. They could drop their spouse. If their spouse gets credible coverage somewhere else, they could drop that spouse. Um, if they left here with the base plan, they can um, not go up to the buy-up. They would have to stay at the base plan. So that's, that's what that means. We did that, or you all implemented that as an effort to try again to capture those costs because we were having quite a few people add additional dependents or um, increase their plan coverage, which was affecting the cost of the, the coverage, cost of providing that insurance. So I wanted to make mention of that just because that is something that was put into place in 2017 this year. Um, there is a statement on here about eligibility for retirement is based on years of service and age. There's been a lot of questions about who's eligible for retirement, when and how, and those types of things. So I wanted to point that out, that depending on someone's years of service and um, their age makes the determination of whether they're retirement eligible or not. And if we turn to the next page, there's an additional chart that I tried to put in there to give you a little more explanation to that as well. 
The retirement system puts people into two classes. You're a class two or you're a class three if you are an employee. Um, the class two employees are those who have earned service credit with the South Carolina retirement system and they were employed prior to July 1st of 2012. Class threes were employed after 2012. So the, if there's a difference. And again, I'm giving you this as general information. Everybody needs to contact the retirement system because they may have credible coverage from another employer. They may be a, a different age. When you reach retirement eligibility, really is dependent upon you individually. So I may reach retirement eligibility because I have service additional to my work here at the city, but someone else, they may not reach it at the same time as me. So it depends on where else you worked and, and, and how much credible coverage you have. So it does make a difference. So, so you, you could be eligible for retirement based on the state, but you haven't had 20, 20 years of service with the city, so you wouldn't carry the health plan into retirement. Absolutely. Absolutely, that's correct, Mr. Mr. Duvall. And we have that issue a lot, um, or vice versa. Employees will come in and say, I'm ready to retire. I went to the retirement system. I've got everything taken care of, and I've worked for 28 years, it's total service, and I'm ready to retire. And they'll say, am I gonna be eligible for retiring insurance here at the city? And I'll look and I'll say, well, you've only worked here 16 years. So you're not eligible because when you started, the requirement was for you to have worked at least 20 years and you're four years short. So then they have to make a decision, right? Do they work another four years or do they retire and, and receive insurance from another source? And so we, we currently have that situation occur and it just depends on when a person starts working for us as to when they're eligible for retiree insurance. Because remember, back on this slide, if they were here prior to July 1st, 2009, they had to have 20 years. But after that, it's 25 or 28 years. Okay? So everybody needs to really be clear about that. Well, There's been a lot of confusion about that particular issue. And I think, Pam, the other confusion is the, the eligibles of the years of service based on the people requirements. So although you've been with the city 20 years, if you were here before July 1st of 20, 2009, because of the state and the way that they've changed, the retirement that may or may not affect you. Absolutely, because you can have 20 years here, but still need another, an additional eight years with the retirement system because you haven't worked your 28 years to be retirement eligible through the retirement system. So there, there are some differences as to when people reach retirement eligibility. So I really wanted to make sure people um, didn't hear that from their their um, colleague. We're getting a lot of that. Well, he's eligible to, well, to retire. I am too. Maybe not. You know, he may have worked at Department of Corrections or DOT or another entity, and he has credible service, and you don't. So it's it it may be a different situation for you. And just because you work 20 years here doesn't mean you're eligible to retire, like you just pointed out. Um, Ms. Devine and Mr. Duvall. Mm. So there, there are some nuances to your eligibility that currently exist. These are things that are current. These, these are current situations. So I want to make sure everybody kind of understood that, understood that there are different classes, understood that there are different requirements. Um, there was some confusion about that police officers and firefighters are subject to the rule of, nine, of, rule of 90, and they're not. Um, their eligibility is, is on that screen as well. So just to make sure that people understand that. Pam, um, last week after your presentation, I had a couple people ask me, you, I know you explained it, explain the rule of 90 again so that people are clear on what that means as far as the state retirement system. Okay, so. Well, I'm sorry, and I was, I'm glad Ms. Devine brought that up too, Pam, because even the second bullet, and we're trying to be as simple as you can, but it's just not simple, that if employed after July 1, 2009, I mean, the rule of 90, because it's not necessarily 25 or 28 years, right? Right, <laughs> so, the, so, and thank you for pointing that out. We were trying to keep it clear. When we're talking about employed prior to July 1, 2009, that's, that's talking about city employment city service. 
So those were the designations we made for people being eligible for health insurance, okay? We made a distinction. In July 1st, 2009, we started people paying premiums. We, we created some plan changes mm -hmm. at that point. So when you all made that decision, or when that decision was made, those individuals who were hired after that, they had to have additional years of service, 25 or 28 years of service, okay? So everybody understand that, right? So the retirement system has always had a separate set of eligibility rules than the city has for its insurance. Because remember, we're self-insured, so we make our own eligibility requirements. The retirement system has a totally separate set of retirement eligibility requirements in order for you to be retired under the retirement system. So does everybody understand that? We got a set of eligibility requirements for city health insurance. We have a set of eligibility requirements for retirement eligibility. One is your health insurance, one is your retirement pension or retirement check. So there's two separate eligibility requirements that you have to meet, to meet both of them, okay? So everybody get that? So if you're employed, if you're a class three and we're employed after a regular retiree, remember, this is not police officer's retirement, but a regular retiree who was employed after 2012 has to reach the rule of 90. And I gave you a little example on the chart. So the rule of 90 says that, uh, it, here's an example, a member who is 56 years old and has at least 34 years of service credit will be eligible for a normal retirement. So 56 plus 34 equals 90. So if you had, you were 60 and you had 30 years of service, that's 90. If you were 50 and you had 40 years of service, that's 90. So your years of service age 10. and your age, <laughs> 80 years old and 10 years of service, that's 90. Your age and your years have to equal 90. And that applies for people who were hired after July 1st of 2012. Okay, and that's your eligibility requirement for the retirement system. So any employees that are hired after 2012 have to read the, meet the rule of 90 in addition to the requirements that we have for yep. insurance eligibility. And currently, those are the ones on that page. So that person would fall in that second criteria and they'd have to have 25 or 28 years of service with the city and meet the rule of 90 with the retirement system. If they were hired after 2012. 2012. It's so confusing, right? For two years you have to know, where were you in 2009 and where were you in, in 2012? Two, that's right. And there's two levels of eligibility that have to be satisfied. You have to be meet those years of service with the city and you have to be retirement eligible. So both of those things have to be in place. And thirdly, you have to be employed with us. From time to time, we do get people who have left us and they say, well, hey, I'm gonna retire from the retirement system and I worked 20 years for the city. Now I want to participate in your insurance. And we say, sorry, you left us prior to becoming retirement eligible and you're not eligible to, to participate in our insurance program. Okay, so I know I've totally confused everybody, but I was trying to be as simple and clear as possible. Does anybody have any questions about that? So that kind of sets the stage for where we are now, trying to explain what the current benefits look like so that we can move forward to make this, the steps that we talked about last week. Before you move on, I do have yes, a sir. question. Yes, sir. Does the rule of 90 apply to the police officer's retirement no, system? No, sir, it does it not. It does not. So it does not. It's, it's age, it's 25 years of service unless you're age 55 or older. If you see the chart that I have below, yeah. that's, that's your eligibility. So you'd be a class two if you were hired prior to July 1, 2012. And as it states, it's 25 years of service on the day of retirement, five of which must be earned service credit. And that means that you have to work for a covered entity and, and do the actual service work. Right. Or be age 55 or older and have five years of earned service credit. So that makes you eligible for police officer's retirement.
retirement if you're a class two. Class three, you have to have 27 years or be 55. 27 years with eight years or be 55 with eight years. Is, is since that, that says 55, is that where we picked up the number uh, age 55 for our retirement proposal that we're debating? That's part of it, but we looked at it from an actuarial perspective and we looked at our current population and the age that our current employees were. were. Because our, <coughs> our average age for our pre-65 retirees is 57 years old. So we were looking for a year around that. And 55 did coincide with this year. And for actuarial purposes, it was a, a year that, that they carved out. But we'll, we'll get to some more discussion about that as we move forward. So as I stated um, in, earlier in the presentation and last week in the presentation, in 2012, we adopted the DDB, or what, what is the DDB? It's the Defined Dollar Benefit uh, for Retiree Health and Healthcare that cut the city's OPEB liability in half to about $110 million during FY13. And again, that was done in an effort <coughs> to try and um, contain those costs and contain that liability. So we set a, you all agreed upon a specific, or the council agreed upon a specific amount so that you could lock in or cap that liability for our retirees. So that was the whole purpose of creating the DDB to, to set that number so that number would move forward and be the consistent number that's used when calculating that liability. Um, the issue that we have is that since FY17, the city has contributed more than the DDB amount as a result of not increasing retiree premium, premiums and not making any plan design changes, and has resulted in an increase of liability to $380.9 million. So that's, you know, one of the big issues that we're dealing with. So the question is, do we maintain the DDB or not? If yes, we're going to continue to cap that liability. If the answer to that is no, then that liability is going to continue to increase. And if we look at our next slide, if we maintain the, D the DDB um, moving forward, if we don't maintain the DDB moving forward, then we're looking at two to four times our liability. Our li liability is going to increase two to four times. So if we don't maintain the DDB, then we need to um, accept the projections of a billion dollar liability by 2047. And we also need to let our credit rating agencies know that we're not, we don't have a DDB that we're honoring. Because that makes a difference when we're looking at our credit ratings and our bond ratings and, and, and those types of things. So if we're not gonna maintain that DDB, we need to stop saying we're gonna maintain that DDB because we're not doing it right now. So in order to maintain that DDB, we've got to take some action, right? So if we move to the next slide, if we decide that we're going to maintain that DDB, then you got to look at who's going to be impacted, whether it's going to be current, active, or future retirees, and what that's going to look like. So um, the, there is a possibility to increase the premiums. You all may remember in September, we gave you some projected increased premiums that were significantly higher than premiums currently are. But again, that was a projection as to how much we had to increase those premiums in order to maintain that DDB. So it meant that we would have to pass those costs all over to, to the retirees to have a higher cost share. So that's why those premiums were significantly increased. Um, if we don't choose to do that, then we have the option of um, doing what we talked about previously and looking into an HRA and have an HRA administrator and a navigator, healthcare navigator to help our employees. Now there are some additional questions that we're gonna to continue to go forward with this discussion, but any questions about that? So, and so to kind of restate that again, council chose not to do the top, one, two, three, four, five, six, was that a hexagon? The top hexagon option back in September. Council chosen that they felt like those higher premiums that were presented, they were estimated, but the reality to maintain the DDB, the premiums would have been significantly higher 
and council chose not to do that at that time. And so we still work through this same discussion and we find ourselves here trying to make decisions and present some different options. So I just want to be really clear about that for our retirees in the room and employees that, you know, there could have been another option before and council did not take that path recognizing that that was, uh, it didn't seem palatable to present those type of premium increases up to the retirees. But we still are left with the same liability and we're still trying to find the option that will work best. And so with these decisions, um, there are some questions that need to be answered. And, and I say it here when I say who's gonna be impacted and how. So those are some of the things we talked about last week. Those are some of the things that we need to continue to discuss going for, forward. So once the decision is made to maintain the DDB, which I hope when you guys vote on the budget today, you make that decision, but of course it is up to you whether you make that decision or not, um, we still are gonna have to answer the following questions. Um, and with these questions, I tried to list them all out so we could be very um, clear on what kind of questions we're looking at trying to answer. So some of our first questions are, um, with the current post-65 retirees, remember we do a what, a 300 and a 225 DDB for them. Will they continue to receive the DDB? That's a question that needs to be answered. Um, with the current post-65 retiree spouses, do we discontinue the DDB or the subsidy for them or not? Um, if it's discontinued, are you going to move that, those funds to the retiree? and they get the, the total amount of that DDB. For our current pre-65 retirees, will they receive the D DDB through the HRA? That's a question that needs to be answered. Um, or will we discontinue the HRA, and will we discontinue the HRA when they become 65? If you make the decision that we don't offer post-65 retiree coverage, then they won't be eligible for post-65 retiree coverage as well. So that's a question that needs to be answered. Um, for the current pre-65 retiree spouses, are you going to discontinue their subsidy, their DDB of 840, or are you going to maintain that? And are we going to do it in, in the form of a, an HRA, or are we going to do increased premiums, or are we going to discontinue their DDB altogether? And again, if we get out of, the, out of offering the DDB for post-65, then they won't be eligible for that benefit as well. So those are a number of questions that we need answers to. As far as the employees are concerned, we talked prior about um, last week about having to make a more um, spread that's, that's more like the 80-20 share. Currently we're at an 88-12 share, which means that the city pays 80% of the premium or the cost of coverage and the employee pays 12%. So it was proposed to phase in some increases in premiums, um, changes in deductibles, out of pocket and copay changes and do some changes to the, the um, prescription coverage. We also are looking at proposing to increase the tobacco use surcharge from $50 to $100 and implementing a spousal surcharge for spouses with credible coverage available to them. You all also mentioned some other questions and we'll get to those as we move forward. Any questions so far? Is that, is that $100 standard? Is that low, is that a high on tobacco surcharge? It's honestly, it's really all over the place. $50 is extremely low, mm -hmm. extremely low. What we see a lot is at least 100 and a lot of people have even higher than that. Um, but $50 is, is really low. Um, as far as the current active employees, um, in order to maintain that 80-20 share, it's proposed that we phase into that, that we make some premium adjustments this year and then make, make some additional ones next year. Please realize that anything that we do this year will go into effect January 1 of 2019. We don't make benefit changes in the middle of the year. We're hearing that a lot. We're hearing that, oh, they're gonna vote and in July my insurance is gonna change. That's not gonna happen. 
whatever whatever's voted on or, or decided upon, it will change the the um, the health insurance for 2019 for next year. We always do health care changes on a annual basis. We don't do it on a fiscal year basis. We don't do it mid year. We don't do it haphazardly. We do it in January so everybody will have an opportunity to know that the changes are coming. And when we do our open enrollment in October, they can make some educated decisions about whether or not they want to change any of their benefit options. Um, so if we're going to phase in that 80-20 that share, we're going to have to increase the premiums and we're going to have to make some plan design changes. And they're the ones that are represented on that prior slide. Phasing in the premiums, changing the deductibles, the out-of-pocket maximums, and increasing the, the search creating a spousal surcharge and increasing the tobacco surcharge. Yes, sir. Since these, um, since these major decisions will be implemented in January, and since we have from the city manager a proposed balanced budget uh, to get us by the legal requirement that we have a balanced budget by the 1st of July, uh, is there a possibility that we could continue this discussion on retiree benefits and health care adjustments a few more weeks after the 1st of July? Well, we're, we're going to get to that. Oh, you're going to yeah, get to that. Yeah, it's, it's something important to no, no dates. And obviously, if we pass a budget, a balanced mm -hmm. budget, we're going to back into mm -hmm. that budget as well. Yep. I mean, so that's going yep. so back it in and back it out. And, and obviously, and I, I want to make sure that as, as we continue to discuss this, we talk about what this long-term liability means financially. And um, although gas rules are changing, what meeting that annual requirement um, to uh, address the long-term liability does to the city budget too. So and that, that, that may not be your shop, it may be your shop or, or what have you, but someone just be prepared to talk about that. Yep, so we'll, we'll get to that in the next couple of slides, but you're absolutely right. Those are, those are very important questions. So with the actives, like I did with the, with the retirees, there's questions that need to be answered. With the actives, are you going to phase in those premium increases to, to get us to that share, as I've said in previous slides, um, increase the deductible, the, the, the prescription structure, increase the surcharges, and then make some decisions about spouses. Are we going to continue to offer spousal coverage? Um, if we do continue, how much are we going to subsidize that, that spousal coverage, and are we going to add a surcharge or not? Those are questions that, that have to be answered about active coverage. As far as future hires or future, future retirees, I should say, um, those are people that we're talking about who are current employees who have not retired yet. That's this category that I'm talking about on this particular slide. So the decisions have to be made of whether we're going to offer retiree coverage or not. We've had some discussions about whether it's going to be those hired before July 1, 2009, those after July 1, 2009, all current employees, um, whether we're going to discontinue that benefit when retirees reach age 65 for this population, are we going to offer a benefit to the spouses, or, and how are we going to subsidize that, or if we're going to subsidize that at all. And then we've talked about whether or not we were going to add a minimum age eligibility requirement whether that'll be 55. We had some discussion about whether that could be 50. Right now we're looking at um, some of the actuarial numbers to see if that five years makes a big difference. Um, from what we're seeing now, it doesn't look like it makes a, makes a huge difference. So it may not be something that really makes a great deal of difference. So it might not be worth doing the 55. Maybe the 50 is better. Maybe no age at all. That's a decision that has to be made. But we'll certainly, you know, as, as we move forward, like you said, um, Mr. Duval, we'll have some opportunity to, to show you some numbers and figures about how those numbers look. Um, then there's the question about um, future employees, people who aren't working for the city yet. What would their eligibility for retiree insurance look like? Will we offer them the DDB or not? Um, what will be their requirements? Um, will their spouses be eligible? Will they be eligible for post-65 coverage? So I tried to summarize kind of the questions that we all um, presented or that people presented during the, the public's um, questions and answers, some things that you all displayed to us or, or asked us in prior meetings and the meeting before. 
And so we really tried to kind of summarize some of those things to put them really clearly in black and white so we could make some decisions and have some discussion about it. So that those were some of the questions, both with the post-65, pre-65, actives, and future hires for the city. Pam, another question I got in the last week, because um, there was a discussion about discontinued coverage after 65. Anyway, um, for people who aren't taking advantage right now of, or they're Medicaid eligible, but they don't understand how that works, if we discontinued coverage, what does that mean as far as their Medicaid and what does that cover? Can you speak to that? Well, Medicare eligibility, you know, they're totally different. That's a totally different right. set of requirements. Um, we do not, we offer a supplement. So everybody that's 65 years of age or older is eligible for Medicare. Um, if they have any questions about that, there are lots of resources out there that can help them sign up for Medicare and be able to do that. They can go to the Social, uh, Social Security Administration and there are other, other um, places they can go to to sign up. But anybody, regardless of where they've worked, anything, whether they're retirement eligible or not, if they're 65, they're eligible for Medicare. So um, they would still have the opportunity to do that regardless of what we offer as our post-65 supplemental coverage. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I think the question that was coming to me is what does that mean if we drop that? That means we would no longer provide the supplement. Right. And so then they would be Medicare eligible and then potentially have to get coverage somewhere else. Like I know other insurance companies uh, pay provide supplement. They'd have to get the supplement. Mm -hmm. And the, our discussion was a navigator could help them with that. Right. With if, if we're going to um, eliminate coverage or we're going to offer an HRA or whatever mechanism we're going to provide to employees, we plan to do a good deal of communication and, and have an uh, opportunity for people to ask questions and help them figure out or navigate what happens next. Um, we Navigators are skilled in working with that population. Um, they say, Look in your medicine cabinet. Give me all your medicine. Let's talk about what you need. Let's talk about what kind of health issues you have. And they can help them figure out which um, provider provides the best coverage for them. But they would potentially, if we stopped offering post-65 supplemental coverage, they'd have to procure their own supplemental insurance or not have any supplemental insurance. Um, a lot of people do because that cuts down on the cost that, they, that Medicare doesn't cover. Um, and so you'll see most people have some type of supplemental plan. But they would have to go out and find their own supplemental plan. And we would want to use a navigator to help them navigate those waters. But they'd have to get their own supplemental plan. Yep, the, the long answer to your question. Typically. It depends on the plan and how it's structured. Yes, sir. There are lots of supplemental um, Medicare plans out there. And it depends on how much they want to pay for it. It depends on what their needs are as to what will be the most beneficial to that particular post-65 retiree. So, um, you know, some of the things that we always talk about when it comes to health care is how we all participate in the cost of our health care. Um, even us active employees and retirees, we have a part to play in how much our health care costs us. And some decisions that our employees should think about making, and we all should make, me, myself included, is deciding to take a more active role in our health um, and to utilize the resources that we have. We currently have an employee health center that's free of charge. We dispense prescriptions, um, and we still have a have a challenge getting people to go to our employee health center, um, and, and that, that's a benefit that's clearly there and clearly accessible for them to use. Um, the wellness incentives we are we have lots of wellness incentives. We giving people up to two hundred twenty five dollars a person, five hundred fifty dollars with them and their spouse for them to perform those health. Um, related activities such as getting a physical and getting your teeth cleaned and, and we have 
you know, 10% of our population take advantage of those things. And that's a sad, sad number. And that's money that's just sitting there that they could be using to, to make sure that they are taking care of their health. Um, become a better health care consumer. If you need an MRI, you don't have to go to the hospital, you can go to an imaging center. Those choices that people make affect the claims that we pay. It's all going in there together. And then ultimately to make better uh, or healthy lifestyle changes and decisions. If you're a smoker, stop smoking. Um, a lot of our um, things that we see are related to, um, the claims are related to diabetes, they're related to hypertension. Some of those things are lifestyle related and we all can you know, do a better job of maintaining and managing our health. And so we want to encourage people to take advantage of the things that we do currently offer. And we want to try and continue to offer those benefits to our employees as we move forward and make these decisions. How many, how many of those things are you, are you legally allowed to acquire for participation? In the you know, since we're self-insured, we really can require most or all of those if we chose to. It would be a manner of a manner of managing it, and how do we make people do it? Um, I know of employers that say, if you don't get your biometric screening, the month after we they set a certain time, and everybody goes that month, and if they don't get it the month after it, they drop them from coverage. They don't have coverage anymore. Now that's an extreme situation, extreme case. But there are other people, for example, Berkeley County, they require all of their employees to go th during a two week period or they increase their premiums significantly for not taking advantage of their biometric screening. Well, Those things provide us with very important information about how we can better manage our population, how we can make you know, different plan design changes, um, how we can be more proactive and more aggressive with how we help people manage their chronic diseases how we help identify things in an earlier stage before they become more dire and more, more costly. All those things matter. Every little thing matters when it comes to health care. Well, if, we, if we were to make it, we could do it for both actives and, and retirees. It's a little harder for retirees since they don't work with us currently now, but that, that's a potential change we could make. Well, I was just going to say to that point, and we, I think I brought it up maybe last year, maybe the year before, but uh, just for my colleagues, that biometric screening is very important. And, and um, you know, it was like when we first brought up the surcharge for tobacco, I think it took us, we talked about it, we brought it up, and it took us three or four years before we implemented it. The biometric screening, screening I talked about that about two years ago, and I really do think that's, I mean, it's incredible for us to know where, you know, we have, um, vulnerable populations that they can, you know, really get something early on before it gets to the point where we have increased claims. And so if that is something that we require, can require, I think we need to seriously consider doing that because that will help us manage. And not just that for cost purposes, but, you know, I do think that there's an, a, a lack of awareness among just people on their health. I mean, I know so many people that will have issues and they don't respond to it they don't you know they don't go to the doctor and then a year later you find out that there is a a, a very uh, grave situation they're in that could have been managed earlier so i think for just the overall health of our employees um, it's kind of like you know the parent telling your child you know this is for your good i think we need to require it and i think ultimately it will not only help us with the cost but it will help our employees live a better life absolutely and that's really the goal. I mean, we, we really are trying to provide um, our employees with those things that make them healthier, happier employees. And, and that, you know, of course, that does have a financial benefit to it, but um, it's, it is very important. And, you know, a lot of times, um, a couple of years ago, we looked at our numbers and 80% of our employees never filed a claim at all. I'm not naive enough to think that that's because everybody's healthy. That's because people just aren't going to the doctor and they're waiting and if at least if we have the biometric screening, we can identify those things early, early stages of things that may become more complicated that can be better managed and be better benefit more beneficial for the employee as well. Reverend McDowell.
Mr. Michael. Is your mic on, Reverend McDowell? Mike. Is your mic on? Sorry. It's on. It's on. It's on. Yeah, it just I just talked that loud. Huh? You're used to preaching, so you're used to. Well, I, I'm used. To, I'm used. To, I am used to preaching. Let the ushers come fall when we take up an offering. Amen. <laughs> um, <laughs> Pam, let me ask you a question. Medicare, 65 years old, you're eligible for eligible for that. What's the? How does it impact us if we provided? Supplemental insurance. Now, the city has done that in the past, I understand. Yes, sir. We currently do that. Currently do it? Yes. We'll continue to do that. If, if that's the decision that's made, right. yes, sir. That's what I'm, yeah. that's it. Yeah. That's what I need. Yeah. Um, and that's one of the questions that I pose to you all is whether or not that is something, that's a benefit you want to continue to offer. What's the impact, Pam, financially? Well, Currently, again, we have a DDB for a defined mm -hmm. dollar benefit for those individuals as well. It's three hundred dollars for the um, post sixty five retiree and two hundred twenty five for their yeah. spouse. So again, that certainly that amount could be adjusted. Um, I will tell you that our supplemental plan is currently through United Healthcare, um, and based upon <coughs> what we've negotiated currently, um, the retirees still have to pay. Um, a little over $200 in addition to what we supplement. So, um, you know, we certainly look every year at renegotiating that plan for our post-65 retirees. The struggle we have is that that group is a small group that has a high level of experience, meaning they have a high level of claims. And so it's, it's, it's a costly coverage to do as a group coverage. Um, and so we, we have to Based on the mix of the population, the age, and the, like I said, the claims experience, we um, get the, the quotes mm -hmm. and, that, we can, that we can get. And sometimes it, it gets costly. And we have those pre post-65 retirees say, I could go out and get my own plan and it would be cheaper. And that is the case. Because maybe we're paying a little bit more because maybe mm -hmm. there's a, a person that's a, a little less well than they are and they're balancing that and what they charge us in premiums for that, that coverage. Um, so the decisions that you all have to make, um, of course, like I said, there are lots of questions that need to be answered. Um, today, you really need to decide whether or not you're gonna maintain that DDB. Whether we use an HRA and who's eligible certainly can be determined at a later date. But you gotta decide if you're gonna um, continue to fund that DDB mm -hmm. in, in its current state. Um, that's how Missy has built the budget, is based on the current DDB of the 1130 per retiree and 840, just those dollar amounts. If you want to change that distribution, we certainly can talk about that. And that's one of the questions we can discuss. Um, you have to vote today, um, as Ms. Wilson said, for the first hearing of the budget. The decision on health care does not change the total amount of the budget that is being adopted as long as you stick with that DDB that's in place now. But mind you, if you stick with that DDB, we got to make some other decisions because that is not covering the total amount of the cost and that will not address the total liability that we are dealing with. So we have to answer those other questions and make those other decisions in order to be able to do, do those things. Um, if you, you know, we're looking at trying to make some more decisions on, Janu on June 19th um, and we don't have to make them that day either but the longer we delay, the less time we have to communicate with people, the less time we have to hire a navigator, the less time we have to do all the things that we need to do. So the quicker we can make this decision, the better. We certainly want to be thoughtful and strategic about it, but we, we do need to, to move forward and make decisions. And it helps because there's a lot of miscommunication and a lot of confusion and a lot of concern. And so the, the sooner we make the decisions, the quicker somebody can make some what is life decisions. And what does maintaining and adhering to the DDB mean for our, a long-term actual liability? What does that number uh, become? A hundred billion dollars if you don't. I mean a billion dollars if you a don't. Billion dollars a billion, billion don't. dollars if you don't. A hundred billion would be a little I bit I appreciate more. the answer, but that wasn't my question. Uh, my question, <laughs> question was, is, is if, we <laughs> if we adhere to it, if we maintain it, if we maintain it and adhere to it. If we adhere to it. 
one second. No, the, no, no, the, the, the billion dollars is, uh, by 2047 is, is, is clear um, what the potential is if we don't do something. Do you know the number top of your head? Is that four, it's, I thought it was at 48 million, but I was just making sure that I'm around 48. saying 48. the right thing. Jeff and Missy certainly can. Why don't you go ahead, and go ahead while, while you guys search for the answer. You keep on going, Pam. So, Pam, in addition to the inf other information as we're making these decisions, um, I know we talked a little bit last week about the spousal um, surcharge. And what that amount would be, and I think we, I think there was a consensus that even the amount that was thrown out might be low. So, could do you have any backup on that so we can make a, a informed decision on what the appropriate spousal surcharge, if we go that direction, should be, so that at least kind of recoups some of the money that we we pay out. We looked last time when when um, Aon was making some recommendations to us. We looked at a hundred dollars. Um, per month to be added right. to that to whatever what premiums, whether that be um, employee spouse or full family. Um, we certainly can look at that a little bit more. That was just their projections, and they gave us, you know, what. So that that hundred, because well, I guess that question came up last week when y'all recommended that, but I was and I also couldn't necessarily hear all there the time you. on the phone. But so that hundred dollars actually came as a recommendation from the consultant. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And they gave us some financial implications if we did the hundred dollars. Of course, if it, we made it more than that, and and you know you made a good point last week is that is that hundred dollars really significant enough? It may be that people don't mind paying that hundred dollars, and it doesn't move people to to go out and get coverage that they already have access to, and and makes them continue to stay on our coverage. But we did get that that projected recommendation from Aon. Yes, please. Jeff, you got an answer? Sorry. What's the number? So in response to your question, if we maintain yeah. the DDB, our total liability is, is 190 million. 190. Okay. And that's the one that Pam showed earlier that if we don't maintain it, it grows immediately to about 380. Sure. It doubles. I, saw that. I saw that. And then over 40 years, it'll grow to it'll a billion. A billion. So it immediately grows so, 200. 300. 300. Yeah, it, it took much, 300 it from 180 doubles, to two. Doubles, yeah, doubles. Yeah. 190 to 380. It could vary based off those other decision points that we are still yeah, trying sure. to make, too. It could be lower than the 190. And then the 48 million is the cash on hand, the money we have yeah, in the bank. Yeah, I knew, I knew that. Um, Mr. Vaughn? I just have a comment at the end, but I didn't know if we're done. No, this is, thanks uh, for so the that, updated that summary as well, uh, adding in the, the questions that I know some of our retirees and employees and, and counsel all asked last week too. Um, all right. So again, you know, those questions at the end, you know, have to make sure we're looking at, um, you know, maintaining it, making the vote today. Um, we still have some opportunity, as Mr. Duvall has asked, do we have some more time to make some of those other decisions? We certainly do have that time. Um, I want people to understand that we are certainly going to be communicating and providing people with information. Um, we certainly don't intend to um, not tell people what the final decisions are and not help them navigate through whatever decisions that are made. Because we want people to be informed and educated and make the best decisions for them. We're not trying to do this in some kind of back room and hide it we're really trying to provide people with information incredibly, this has been incredibly transparent and yes, informative we're so trying no, to don't, be don't, don't worry don't worry about that extremely transparent yeah. and, and and we Vietnamese. want people to have the information it is much better for for me as an hr professional and us as a city staff and people know mm -hmm. what benefits they have i can't tell you how many people who haven't a clue about what they have now and they're complaining about stuff that they don't even know that they even got and, and it's like Learn, research and understand what you have and be able to utilize it to your best benefit and then have an, you can ask an educated yeah. question about it going forward. Right. 
And Thanks. many of our current employees, too, Mr. Mayor, who can't necessarily have the benefit of being in this room right now, as retirees may have, who can come. I mean, they are, too, the, per the people that may be impacted. And so there will be opportunities where we share that information. But it's important for me that we manage how we share information when decisions have been made as well. I mean, there's certain points in time. Right now, we're still discussing. We're trying to make final decisions. And any employees who can watch on the stream and listen in, I think that's great. But at the right time, we will be clear about the decisions that have been made as well, because it can this get is, is very, more confusing. Very yeah, I thank Pam very much so for putting this presentation together the way she did today. Do I sense from you all that that decision point number one, though, about maintaining the DDB is the direction we need to go? Because that does impact the bigger budget reading and just in general that frames everything. Yeah. If, if we don't maintain the DDB, then we wind up with a long-term liability that's larger than the city budget itself and that's untenable um, and unsustainable. Uh, so I think yes, um, as relates to maintaining the DDB as well as um, uh, making sure we maintain the, the 80-20 um, um, split on, on premiums well with active employees and we can talk about everything else and you, but you guys need to give us some hard and fast uh, discussion points how we operate within the, the borders as we discuss through everything else I do think it's compelling um, as we look at the uh, the continuing increase in, in uh, costs at being self-insured particularly from chronic uh, illnesses that we really start putting some real um, Sticks, less carrots. Uh, yeah, I mean, we, we, we got to. We, we, it's, just, it's just not sustainable. We, we, got, we got to make sure we, we hold the line and ensure that our people are healthy, uh, um, and, which includes all of us, uh, I might add. Uh, uh, by, um, That's why y'all have vegan dinner tonight. Thank you. Oh, y'all really? <laughs> will enjoy it. Didn't know that. Didn't know that. Um, but, uh, yeah, I think that's a sense of the body, and we'll have to figure out, again, how creative we can be within those, those boundaries to, to devise a, a plan that works for, for everyone. Yes, sir. It's just a question. Um, you know, we're talking now about the communications to, to, to staff and, and uh, employees to get the most accurate information and timely. Are we doing anything differently now doing our discussions to communicate or and inform employees where we are now? We have not sent out anything, you know, other than the, the presentations that have been attached to the agendas and to the information that you all have discussed. We have not done anything um, more specific than that. And, I'll, and as Ms. Ms. Wilson has said, um, we talked to department heads about it just so they could have some information um, and just so we could give them an opportunity to hear it firsthand. Um, but we certainly want to be able to provide our employees with as much accurate and current information as possible. What my intentions were with Ms. Wilson's approval is to send out the presentation that was done today um, to staff so that they will have a copy of it. Again, it's, it's, you know, it'll be attached to the minutes of the meeting, but certainly want to make sure that they have an opportunity to see it as well. And so we'll be attaching it. Um, and sending it out so that they'll, they'll have the opportunity to see it if Ms. Wilson is good with that. But again, it's their decisions that have to be made. Yeah. So, right. you know, we can, we will do that. You know, I'm, I'm, employees can come sit and talk with me and Pam individually. I mean, we will do that. But what happens many times is until you, some of the, the, the key decision points that we went through today, the various questions, it will create more questions and more unknowns and more confusion if we don't provide you with some guidance to say, you know, you really just need to make this decision right here. I know it's hard. We surely don't take it lightly, but the decisions have to be made. And the longer we wait to make them, that's where the confusion continues. Yeah. Yeah. Do we have any um, research, particularly if, if Berkeley County has been through this process on biometric screening, 
I mean, it's kind of what success they've had or maybe not as relates to health care outcomes and as well as the fiscal uh, impact of, uh, of folks. Um, oh, excuse me. Can we get that? Can we I please? was going to say, yeah. I, I've spoken to them that? anecdotally about it, um, but I'm certain that I, they expressed that they would share, you know, any feedback or any data they have related to that. Um, you know, I'm not sure if they're fully insured or, or, or if they are um, self-insured. Sure. Um, so we'd have to get those things too, because of course nothing happens in a vacuum, and other things impact that. But, but we'll certainly reach out to them and see what information we can we can we can helpful. gather about that. It'd be helpful. No, he's on. He's on mute. Daniel, you still there? I can kind of hear something. <laughs> he may have. Well, yeah, there he's asleep. He said something. Danielle. Yeah, I'm here. All right. Any any questions? Let me wait for it. It's going in and out. It's going in and out. Delay. Repeat it. We, you, we yeah, you. You, you actually are answering. We can hear you. I'll just send him a text. Mr. Rickman, did you have any questions or comments that you'd like to make? Goodbye. Uh -huh. Ms. Devon, did you? Well, I just was going to make a comment. Um, so yes, last week I was um, at the Women in Municipal Government uh, summer meeting, and so we had healthcare was one of our sessions. We had a very good conversation, but um, there are a lot of cities nationally that are not providing coverage to retirees at all. Um, there are a lot of cities who um, their current employees pay a lot more in, in premiums, and I was really just kind of shocked. Um, I thought it would be more 50 50, and I was probably more in the minority in the room. Um, and then the other thing that shocked me, Mr. Mayor, is a lot of the um, elected officials knew nothing about GASB when I mentioned GASB. So it tells me that they're not participating, or at least they're not knowledgeable about that impact on them. And I was really kind of surprised on that. But, but I say that to say I, I, everyone's having these discussions. It's not easy, it's, it's, um, but it has to be discussed. But I think that really the long-term impact on our employees' wellness should be our prevailing priority. And I think if we keep that focus, then ultimately I think the, the cost will, will be in line as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Mr. Rickman said he's um, some additional uh, requests he made last week, uh, additional information. He's, he's still waiting on some of that information. Some, can he hear me? Can no, he you can't me? hear you, I'm texting him. So. Just text him, say, we'll, okay. we'll provide. Okay. All right. Some specific questions. Okay. All right. Thank you, Ms. Benjamin. Thank you, Ms. Benjamin. Great job. Mr. Mayor, at this point, I'm not sure if you were entertaining any other comments, questions. Dick, I know you guys are here. Uh, is there anyone else who wanted to, who wanted to add any input on this? There's a little more information than last week. Uh, the, um, and we're going to, Keep on churning it out and keep the dialogue going. And um, as Mr. Howard, uh, Mr. Duval suggested, we'll keep talking about how we operate within those lines. And and, and some of you, uh, uh, Ms. Devine, referenced the Gatsby rules that some of you are very familiar with. Some may not be um, as familiar with. But as we look at the long-term costs of, 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 of providing uh, medical and uh, dental benefits, non-pension-related benefits. We have to set aside every year a certain amount of money to cover that long-term actuarial liability. Uh, your city has been um, a whole lot more responsible than some cities around the country, as Ms. Devine mentioned. And as a result, a lot of the cities are, are, are going to see some really, really challenging days ahead. They're going to see their bond ratings drop 
precipitously there, um, they're going to see actually non pension related liabilities probably uh, climb to uh, greater than their pension related liabilities. The amount of money we have to set aside every year to meet that long term liability, which um, if we're able to get this done successfully, will we'll stick at about $180 million. If we don't do anything, it will grow to two times that. And if we continue on this path, it will, it will be projected to be about a billion dollars uh, in, in 2047. And it's just unsustainable. We're gonna, we're gonna wind up being a health insurance company without any other ability to provide any other services. So we've gotta figure out how we continue staying focused on employee health, focus on retiree health, and at the very same time having a sustainable uh, 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 health insurance, a benefits program that we can just meet the needs of our employees and our retirees. Now, between those two lines, there's a whole lot of different considerations that Ms. Benjamin raised that, that, um, that each of the council members raised in, in the different areas of, of, of their concern, whether our focus ought to be simply on, em, on employees or, if, if, or spouses or retirees and retirees and dependents, what we do about supplemental uh, coverage, how we handle all these issues, but we're going to have to figure out how we do whatever we do within those lines that allow us to have fiscal sustainability. Um, it's not easy. Uh, and, and there's been every effort, I think, uh, this year, and staff has done a good job. And, we, and, we, and as you all know, we, we kicked the can down the road to allow for more, more research, more dialogue, more conversation, and we'll keep doing that over the next several months as we work out the final points of this plan. What, what does seem to be clear, maybe partially because of, of, of some of the silence in the room and some of the points raised, is that I think we're going to have to start really pushing uh, everyone to continue using the Employee Health Center to really start taking advantage of some of the wellness initiatives to try and, and, and make sure we all become a, a bit healthier. Uh, and, that, and, that, and that's council, that's, that's staff and, 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 and retirees, because those chronic costs are, as, as a self-insured entity are just out of control. And, we, and we've got to figure out how we get our arms wrapped around it. Uh, we do this every couple of years, which makes no one happy, but we're required to, uh, to do this every couple of years. We've got to go back and look at it every couple of years. And um, it's never fun. Um, I think we probably do as, as good a job as, as, as you can possibly do in these, in, these, in these difficult situations. And we have to adjust to these shifting sands as we, as we um, uh, do every couple of years. Mm. Uh, as Ms. Devine mentioned, some policymakers aren't even talking about these issues. And I will tell you, they have massive growing long-term liabilities that will be impossible in their respective cities and, and, and states, uh, from uh, Illinois and Texas to Pennsylvania, to get out from under uh, uh, at, at some date in the probably not too distant future. We can't put Columbia in that position. Uh, we will wind up having uh, um, robust health, uh, medical and dental benefits without um, being able just to cover basic services. And that's just not where we want to be. And I, I don't believe that's where any of us in this room want to be. So um, if anyone has any, who didn't speak, or if you did speak, you have something to add as on point. Um, if there's a question, uh, let's make it a question if, if there's a statement. Um, well, again, last week we, uh, we, we did it. We, we normally don't have uh, Q&A at, at, um, at work session, but I thought it was actually incredibly edifying and informative. Um, so if, if someone has something else to add, there will be a continuing conversation as to what the plan looks like. And, and we look forward to uh, your continued engagement there. You sure can. Roland, introduce yourself for the, for the, for the, for the uh, benefit of those who are not in the room. Good and for the record. Mr. Mayor, members of City Council. My name is Roland Smallwood. I'm one of your retirees. I heard about this by chance. I didn't know about it. Somebody called me and told me that City Council were going to be discussing something that had to do with the insurance of retirees and, of course, current employees. I don't stand here to minimize the importance of what you ladies and gentlemen have on your plate. I must tell you, after working for this city for a number of years, you have a human's job in front of you. I don't envy you. I don't want to be sitting in your spot right now.
because I know how tough making this kind of decision can be. Neither do I stand here to trivialize what staff have done. I think they've done a wonderful job. It's a hard thing to do. But I simply stand here to say, <clears throat> please, listen or take into consideration the request of Mr. Duvall right now. Because you see, it is in discussion that we may be able to come up with something that somebody is not thinking about. And to start thinking about taking a vote now as to what you do with this because of the time restraint that's on it. If there's any time that you all have that you all can discuss this even further, please, by all means, use that time to discuss it further. Secondly, some of us are here. We may not be working anymore. We may not look as old as we are. I'm 70 years old, 70. I go to the doctor three times a year. I take no medication. So I want to know from HR what is United Healthcare doing with all of the money that I'm saving? I go for general physical, I go for eye checkup, and I go for my whatever plastic checkup they need to do on me. That's all. And I take no medication. Okay? So if somebody like me, who's 70 years of age, sees the doctors three times a year, and as a matter of fact, I've only seen a doctor two times this year because all of last year, or most of last year, I was out of state working for FEMA in Florida. Mm -hmm. What's happening to all of the money that somebody like me saving to my supplementary insurance? Is that your last question? Please. Last question? Okay, thank you, Ralph. And uh, it, you all take that yeah. into consideration it, 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 and sure. let us know the next time. No, thank you. Or some of us can give some suggestions. No, absolutely. Um, incredibly valuable counsel from our retirees. I think we already agreed that we would, we would take Mr. Um, Duval's advice um, under um, consideration. That we're, gonna, we're gonna have additional dialogue. Uh, I'd, I'd also suggest, just as an answer to your question, Roland, that you, you are not atypical, uh, that, that, that everyone uh, uh, is, 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 is in, um, gone three times a year, including people who are half your age, I might add. Um, uh, I'm not half your age, I just pointed at myself. Uh, but I mean, so every, everyone's different. And as a, as a result, I mean, that's kind of the nature of insurance. Um, we, we, we take care of each other, and that's what we're trying to do. But we're going to have continued dialogue. And um, if you've got some other ideas, we'd love to hear them. Love to hear them. Yes, sir. Hi, my name is Jeff Dickey. I'm a retired police officer. And I think, Ms. Benjamin, this presentation was much better than the last one. It had much more information in it. The big uproar from the law enforcement, the fireside, was the magic 55 number. Mm -hmm. And also, at the last meeting, we were told we were under the rule of 90, which we knew we were not. But we were told that all state retirement was under the rule of 90. So I think the big thing, and it's not for me because I'm retired, but for the firefighters and the police officers, they meet state eligibility at 47 or 48, and it's the 55 number that was really the, the problem that caused the uproar. I don't think it was miscommunication. I don't think it was misunderstanding. And I highly encourage you to send that out to them. The presentation you did was much more beneficial. And it tells them, because we know you got to make decisions. And you could have, you know, and the thing is, things have to change. But it's changed on somebody that started working here 30 years ago and was promised a lot more than we got now. Because 30 years ago, even 20 years ago, we were promised free for life if you met these requirements. And when you change, I think the change needs to be geared more towards the future because those people were not promised the same things we were. You know, people that started 30 years ago, and I started in 1988, were told, you meet these requirements, free insurance for life. When you started charging, everybody's like, yeah, it's still really cheap and it's really good. And I tell everybody, 
Our insurance is better than anybody's. I don't know anybody that's got insurance as close as good as ours. But you know, we know there has to be changes, but so drastic on the older group that was promised better versus the newer group, I think there's got to be some kind of balance. But the big uproar, I think, was the 55. And that's, that's all I had, but I appreciate you again taking questions. Thank again, you. much better. I, I think you should send it to everybody. Mm -hmm. the, the presentation was done today. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Aaron, I just, I have to acknowledge the word promised. I mean, there are no promises in government or in the entity in which we work. So I understand things that may have um, been implemented at certain periods of time, but just for clarification in the media and all the social media where there's a lot of, you know, igniting people to come because something was promised, that is not how it operates in the entity in which we work. I certainly acknowledge what you were told. I certainly acknowledge what the rules were then and that rules change. But there can be no promises with the council form of government because these council members no. don't even, aren't even making binding decision on future councils. So that's just not a terminology that needs to be used. Yeah. No, no. Well, thank, thank you. Yes, sir. Mr. Thank Mayor, you. I appreciate it. It's the first time I've ever addressed y'all. My name is David Crossland, and I worked for the Columbia Fire Department for 25 years. Yes, sir. And uh, in saying what you, you just spoke of, I believe a man's word or a woman's word is the bond. What you say when they come here, the council that was in place when I come to work here told me if I fulfill these duties, mm -hmm. that they would look after me and my family. And as the police officer spoke of, I understand the rising cost of health care. 19% of a gross national product is a pretty substantial debt on this nation and a municipality. I understand that. But what I'm trying to point to you is with the retirees before 2012, and the ones that's been here 25, 30 years and have retired, I want, Mr. Mayor, Council, I want you to understand that, you, the, that what was told to us when we come to work here is, it is a way of life with us. It is our income. It is the way that we live. It's, it's the welfare of our families. I mean, just to snap your fingers and take it away from us like that and to, to even think about that is an atrocity upon the men and women that's given their lives to this city. I come to work here at $12,000 a year. I had to work two and three jobs to make ends meet. Didn't mind it. I love working for the city. I love working for the citizens of the city of Columbia and the county of Richland, and, and I give my heart and soul into it. My wife, she sit right there with me. She washed them dirty, nasty, cancer-causing clothes that I brought home every day from fires that we fought out here in the street where we knew nothing about the cancer-causing elements in our clothes and in our bodies and the things that we, that we fought through that, that we've come to realize today. My wife has cancer now. My wife has pancreatic cancer now. I don't know if it's caused from that or not, but she suffered for 25 and 30 years just like the rest of us. And to say that she doesn't matter is an atrocity upon me. I, 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 can't, I can't say that about my wife. I mean, because she's been right there with me through thick and thin, through everything that I've gone through. She's just as much a part of it as I am. So, I understand the cost may go up, but please, please guys, you got to think about this is a way of life for us. We depend on this. We know costs will go up. We understand that. But you can't just kick us to the curb because we're giving it all to you guys and we expect a little bit back from y'all. Thank you. Well, thank, thank you. Prayers for your wife. Hello, my name is Jacob Eller. I'm the president of the Columbia Firefighters Association. I represent uh, not only our active firefighters, but our retirees. And it's by nature of the job that we also work with several divisions within the city. Um, the one thing that I, I really enjoyed hearing was the part about uh, communication and having an open lines of communication with all the employees because a lot of people didn't know that these work sessions were happening. So uh, I appreciate that. And, and uh, we're going to disseminate information as well. Uh, the other thing is the wellness incentive. Um, that's a huge. Um, that's a that's a huge thing for me, and a thing that we're trying to push uh, along with the fire department. Uh, uh, last year, when we had these discussions, 
uh, there was talk about us uh, forming a committee of both active and retired members that can have buy-in with anything moving forward. So uh, what I would ask is that uh, we can put uh, people like uh, us, put some of our retirees at the table and come up with a plan together, something that uh, everybody can um, agree upon. I appreciate your time. And I think that, that dialogue always helps, Jacob. It, it always helps. It, it could be helpful as well as we go, go, go forward. Yeah. Yes, sir. Right. I appreciate your time, and uh, we'll talk to you soon. That'd be great. Thank you. All right. One more. Hey, Mayor. <laughs> Mayor Council. Um, I used to be city clerk, but then I've retired. And I don't, none of you were here in 89 when I was hired. I was hired making $14,000 a year. The city saved money by paying us lower wages, providing us with insurance. By doing so, that didn't add to our state retirement. So now when we have to pay for our insurance, we're paying it out of our state retirement that is lower than if we would have paid what normal wages in the private sector were paid at that time. So it's taken money away from us that the city saved in the long run. And we were told we'd have insurance when we retired. So I think you need to consider the promises made to the employees at the time they were hired. If you want to change that at a certain date, I have no problem with that. You should stay your commitment with the commitment that was given to us at the time we were hired. And I appreciate your time. Thank you. Appreciate your time. Thank you. All right. Um, <coughs> Mr. Mayor, I, I do want to clarify one more time, too, that part of Pam's uh, presentation today that she did not include from the last time that was really clear is that there would still be uh, a coverage component for the retirees. That that's what the HRA is. So I don't want it to get lost. Yeah. And that's when I, and, and they, and there, no and, one, and, there's been no, yeah. no proposal that said yeah. there would not be coverage yeah. in some, some form for the retirees. I think the more, the more dialogue, the more discussion we have, the better things get, the more, the more, yeah, the more, the more we share information. So uh, it gets better and better. I'm going to intend a motion to go to executive session. Uh, is, um, is anything else on the agenda, uh, Mr. Duval? I'd like to move we go into executive session to the discussion of negotiations instant to propose contractual arrangements pursuant to Code Section 30-4-782, the home serve rate increase. All right. Uh, is uh, a second? Second. Wait, Wait a minute. I got some more. I got some more. <laughs> and the Columbia Canal. Receipt of legal advice uh, under Code Section 30-4-70A, Winter Odom et al. versus City of Columbia. Receipt of legal advice related to matters covered by attorney-client privilege pursuant to 70A2, HUD, CDBG, Entitlement Funding, Lorick Place Housing, uh, Columbia Housing Authority request. Is there a second? Second. With the previous question, Clerk call the roll. I'm sorry, Mr. McDowell. Executive session? Mr. Duvall? Aye. Mr. Vine? Aye. Mr. Davis? Aye. Mayor Benjamin? Aye. Thank you.